in the attack. Russians were known to fight until death. For example, in the breakthrough of the fortifications before Bryansk in October 1941, enemy bunkers, which had long since been bypassed by German forces and which for days lay far behind the front, continued to be held by isolated Soviet groups when every hope of relief had vanished. The Eastern Front was known for its massive scale of operations and sheer brutality. The following information comes from interviews led by Americans of German officers in late 1947 and early 1948 in case of a war with the Soviet Union. The characteristics of the Russian soldier presented in this video mainly applies to the infantry because it represented the bulk of the Red Army. It is also important to note that the Germans use Russian as a synonym of Soviet quite frequently. On top of that, the following information represents the German perception of Soviet soldiers in four main points, which certainly contains some sort of bias and does not represent my personal opinion. The Russian spirit covers a wide range in which fanatic conviction, extreme bravery, coupled with childlike kindliness and susceptibility to sudden fear and terror. His fatalistic attitude enables the Russian to bear extreme hardship and privation. He can suffer without succumbing. In August 1941, after Panzer divisions broke through the Luga breachheads, the commander of a Kampfgruppe inspected several Russian tanks which had been knocked out two hours earlier near a church. A large number of men were resting. Suddenly, the turret of one of the knocked out tanks began to revolve and fired. After initial panic, the tank was blown up. It turned out that among the crew, which had been assumed dead, there still was a commissar that was unconscious. When he came back to his senses and saw the many German soldiers around him, he immediately opened fire. There are two noticeable characteristics of the Russian soldier. Stubbornness in the defense, inflexibility in the attack. Directly after the crossing of the Bog River in July 1941, the fortifications, which had been cleared of the enemy by the 167th Infantry Division, were occupied a few days later by groups of stragglers and subsequently had to be painfully retaken by a division which followed in the rear. At times, the Russian soldier displayed so much physical and moral fortitude that he had to be considered a first-rate fighter. On the other hand, he was by no means immune to the terrors of a battle of attrition with its combination of mass fire and bombs. Whenever he was unprepared for their impact, these weapons of destruction had a long-lasting effect. In some instances, when he was dealt a severe, well-timed blow, a mass reaction of fear and terror would throw him and his comrades completely off balance. The Russian soldier's kinship with nature was significant. As a child of nature, the Russian instinctively knew how to take advantage of every opportunity nature had to offer. He was unaffected by cold, heat and wet weather. He was able to find cover and adapt himself to any terrain. Darkness, fog and snowdrifts were no handicap to him. The Russians always dug in. Even under enemy fire, the Russians skillfully dug foxholes and disappeared underground without any visible effort. The Russian soldier used his axe with great dexterity, felling trees, building shelters, blockhouses and bunkers, constructing bridges across waterways or timber trackways through swamps and mud. Working in any weather, he accomplished each job with an instinctive urge to find protection against the effect of modern weaponry. On many occasions, German reconnaissance patrols passed through the immediate vicinity of Russian positions or individual riflemen without noticing them and were then taken on the fire from behind. Caution was doubled in wooden terrain. In such areas, the Russians often disappeared without a trace and had to be driven out one foxhole at a time. Here, sniping from trees and camouflage machine guns were effectively used by the Russians. It has already been pointed out that the Russian soldier was as good as immune to seasonal and terrain difficulties. Furthermore, he was almost a complete master of the terrain. There appeared to be no terrain obstacles for the infantrymen. He was as much at home in dense forests as in swamps or trackless steppes. 
even the broad Russian streams were crossed quickly with the aid of the most primitive expedients. It could never be assumed that the Russian would be held back by terrain normally considered impassable. It was just in such places that his appearance and frequently his attack had to be expected. The Russian soldier could completely overcome any terrain obstacles in a very short time if he wanted to. And forests had a magnetic attraction to the Russians. Because of their affinity to nature, the Russians were completely at home in woods and knew how to take good advantage of them. From the outset of Operation Barbarossa, the German tactical superiority was partly compensated by the greater physical fitness of Russian officers and their men. During the first winter, for instance, the German army high command noticed to its grave concern that the Russians had no intentions of digging in and allow operations to stagnate along fixed fronts like in World War I. The lack of shelter was not an excuse for the Russians to attack German strong points by day and night, even though the temperatures went far below freezing point. The Russians preferred to carry out their major offensives in winter because their troops were accustomed to that season and very well equipped and trained for it. To that effect, casualties from the cold were an exception. In the winter of 1941-1942, the Soviets were able to spend many days in the snow without detriment to their health. This is when they carried out their first major offensive in the area west of Moscow. Starting in November 1942, they succeeded in encircling the German 6th Army in Stalingrad overrunning the front of the German allies and penetrating up to 500 kilometers towards the west. On Christmas of 1943, they began the Russian offensive from an area southwest of Kiev. It continued until the thaw period of March 1944 and led to the annihilation of German divisions in the Cherkassy pocket, the encirclement of Ternopol and of the German 1st Panzer Army. Lastly, the Russian general offensive began along the entire Eastern Front in mid-January of 1945. It led to the loss of Hungary, Poland, Silesia, East Prussia and Pomerania. Of the same nature was the Russians' constant effort to establish bridgeheads. They were most often carried out by means of infiltration. Postponing their elimination was a fatal mistake. Though only one Russian company might have occupied a newly formed bridgehead in the evening, by the next morning, it was sure to have turned into an almost invincible fortress held by at least a regiment and bristling with heavy weapons. No matter how heavy and accurate German fire was, the flow of men into the bridgehead continued. Regardless of all countermeasures, the bridgehead continued to swell until it ran over. Only by using very strong forces and planned attack could it still be contained or eliminated provided one was lucky and not afraid of heavy losses. The unpredictable mood of the Russian soldier and his very pronounced herd instinct made it possible for panics to arise suddenly in individual units. As often as one found it impossible to explain the fanatic resistance of individual units, as frequently did one encounter a mystery in the mass flights or sudden entire surrender. The reason may have been an invisible fluctuation in morale, which could not be counteracted by any political commissar. The group gave the Russian strength and courage. The Russian infantryman was a member of a herd, preferring to fight in concert with others rather to be left on his own. In the attack, this characteristic was obvious in the mass lines, sometimes even packs. Meanwhile, in the defense, the Germans constantly witnessed stubbornly resisting bunkers. Here, there was no individual action for one's personal advantage. Everyone fought as one man. One must never believe that a Russian attack, which had been twice repulsed with unheard of losses, will not be repeated a third and a fourth time at the same place and in the same fashion. Unimpressed by previous failures and losses, new waves always came on. An unusual inflexibility of mind and a stubborn lack of imagination lay in this use of masses and was dearly paid for. It will never be possible to estimate Russian war casualties with any degree of accuracy. There will always be potential error of many hundred thousands. This inflexible method of warfare, 
with the objective of accomplishing everything through the use of human masses, or the masses of material, is the most costly of all. The year 1943 brought a definitive change in the method of attack. Concentrated artillery strikes were employed more frequently and supplemented by massed mortar attacks. The Russians tried to infiltrate through known German weak points. For this purpose, they preferred forest areas or hollows previously designated by the tactical command. If they succeeded in infiltrating the enemy system, they immediately entrenched themselves in lead mines. After that, a period of vulnerability set in because they would bring up the artillery and heavy weapons very slowly to the front and cooperation with them ceased abruptly. The employment of mass tanks brought about a revolutionary change in Russian tactics in 1944. After a drum fire of artillery, a large number of tanks went over to the attack, followed by the infantry in deep wedges. While the artillery gave good support at first, communications with it frequently broke off during a further advance. Until the very end of the war, it was difficult for the Russians to coordinate fire and movement. The penetrations were deep and invariably in a straight line. Then the halt was called in order to bring up the greatest possible number of infantry during the night. These masses of infantry dug in as soon as they caught up with the points of the attack. In the end, it is the incredible stubbornness and the constant unpredictable ways of the Russian soldiers that kept German soldiers on their toes. One time Russians would give up sooner than anticipated. On another occasion, all efforts were to no avail, nor any flank attacks faced the Russians. However, in my opinion, German generals on the Eastern Front often came up with a multitude of reasons, such as the overwhelming number of Soviet forces and the inherent strength of the Russian soldier to camouflage their own mistakes, both on operational and strategic levels.